Thank you, Megan. Um, welcome, everybody. I, too, would like to just join Megan in acknowledging the um, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional and ongoing custodians of the lands on which the MCA is sited, and to um, pay my respects to all First Nations peoples uh, who are joining us here today. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody. I thought I would begin the conversation just with a little bit of an introduction for you um, uh, to Zoe's work, um, just to help situate uh, this extraordinary uh, work, El Rio to the River, that we have just opened um, as an exhibition in the MCA galleries. Um, so I will read, I'm sort of juggling a few supports here, so I will read this <coughs> intro. So be please do bear with me. Uh, as we've heard from Meg, Zoe then it is indeed one of the most acclaimed artists of her generation. Her work has been the subject of major exhibitions in the United States and in Europe in particular, including solo exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, at the Dear Art Foundation in New York, uh, at the, Muse the Museum of Modern Art uh, Stiftung Ludwig in Vienna, uh, and she has also presented her work in uh, important exhibitions, notably uh, Documenta 9 and 12. And then uh, her work was presented in the Whitney Biennials of 1993, 1997 and 2014. In 2018, the Whitney Museum of American Art accorded her a retrospective exhibition sur survey, which then uh, travelled to the Los Angeles Museum of Count. Uh, Los, An Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art. I'm just showing here actually a glimpse of um, survey at the Whitney in 2018. You can see the building looking out over the Hudson. Known for her monumentally scaled photographic projects, Leonard has also created sculptural and site-specific installations that have become iconic works of the late 20th and early 21st century. Leonard's works are to be found in museum collections, including MoMA New York, the Guggenheim Museum, also in New York, the Philadelphia Museum of Art in Philadelphia, Rena Sophia Museum in Madrid, and Tate in London. In Australia, Leonard's work has been seen very little, but there have been sightings, rare, I would say. In 1982, in an ex so for many of you, um, before you were born, um, in an exhibition at the Hogarth Gallery in Sydney, alongside the work of Sidney Nolan. In 1997, in the group exhibition On the Body, curated by Tony Bond for the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and in the exhibition With and Without You, Revisitations of Art in the Age of AIDS, in 2002 at the Ivan Doherty Gallery at, at the Sydney College of Fine Arts. One of Leonard's photographs was also presented here at the MCA in 2000 as part of the exhibition Veronica's Revenge, which was a touring exhibition of the Lambert, um, the Lambert collection of photography from Switzerland. Throughout her career, Zoe Leonard has worked with analog photography. Her black and white silver gelatin prints with their graphic framing of a black border that marks the demarc or demarcates the image from its support have become characteristic, almost signatures of her, of her photographs. Similarly, the use of repetition and the shifting viewpoint are recognizably Leonard and part of her invitation to acknowledge, uh, invitation to us to acknowledge the act of looking and what we choose to understand through that act as culturally, socially and historically constructed. Leonard's early photography series of anatomical models and the preserved heads of bearded ladies draw attention to the ways in which gender is codified in the structure of collections and their displays. That a bearded woman is a curiosity and the anatomy of a woman defines the, way, the ways in which she dresses and wears her hair, for example. For Leonard's participation in Documenta 9 in Kassel, Germany in 1992, curated by Jan Hurt, Leonard affected what has been described as a gendered interruption of museum norms from a queer perspective, 
by removing the walls of the Neue Gallery's collection of 18th century portraits of works painted by male artists and replacing them with black and white photographs of the hairy vulvas of friends and lovers. Roberta Smith, critic of the New York Times, described these chaste black and white photographs of women's genitals, which made, of course, reference to Gustave Courbet's famous painting, The Origin of the World, as making manifest the ma male gaze, which feminist art theory holds, holds that most art was made for, and in a way that was shockingly direct, funny, and beautiful. Biography and metaphor and engagement with the world around her are recurring aspects, such as in this emblematic installation, of which I'm showing you a view, Strange Fruit, uh, created between 1992 and 1997, and now in the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The work uh, is one of sewing up and suturing loss in the wake of the AIDS crisis. 1961, which is uh, this work behind me, um, uh, from 2002, and now in the collection of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York, is a cumulative and I would suggest performative work that grows with the addition of a blue suitcase for each year of the artist's life. Tipping Point, it's effectively a stack of books of the same book, The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, um, uh, was created in 2016 uh, at a time of racial tension in the, in the United States. Similarly, real life and daily routines are to be found throughout Le Leonard's Earth, be it her own New York neighborhood on Manhattan's Lower East Side in the early 1990s, uh, which was the point of departure for her series of photographs of trees and fences, And her icon iconic photographic work, Analog, uh, now in the collection of the museums, uh, in two collections, of the uh, one in the collection of the Museum Reina Sofia in Madrid, and the other in MoMA, the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, comprised over 400 photographs organized into 25 cha chapters. Analog was created over the course of a decade, between 1998 and 2009. It documents uh, the eclipsed texture of 20th century urban life as seen in vanishing mom and pop stores, as they're known in the US, and the simultaneous emergence of the global rag trade. Leonard followed the circulation of recycled mer merchandise, used clothing, discarded advertisements, and the old technology of Kodak camera shops to far-flung markets in Africa, Eastern Europe, Cuba, Mexico, and the Middle East. I mean, I'm really paraphrasing hugely here to describe one of the sort of truly great works um, by Zoe, um, but it's really just to give you a sense of um, where she has the arc of her practice. Described as deceptively simple and remarkably complex, the camera obscura works are another example of Leonard's engagement with space as an integ integral aspect of her engagement with photography. And here I'm showing you actually the view, the projected image um, f uh, in the camera obscura, obscura that Zoe created for the, uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art on Madison Avenue, designed, uh, the architecture was designed by Marcel Breuer, I'm sure many of you have, have seen this in books if not in real life, and this was for the 2014 Whitney Biennial. Um, just a few of this signature beautiful window uh, looking that looks out onto Madison Avenue. Uh, and then here um, I'm showing you a view of a camera obscura that Zoe made in a former ice factory uh, in uh, Marfa. Uh, this was in the early 2000s. For this work, Leonard affected uh, an architectural repair and visual recalibration of this former ice factory, a former industrial, light industrial building, uh, to create her subsequent immersive photographic apparatus that captured the landscape in real time. And I think the work can be seen as something of a harbinger of the work that she would make um, as El Rio, which she, and which she would begin some three years later. 
It is in the 2000s that we begin to see a continuation of this conceptual and spatial expansiveness with Leonard's hybrid, concept, uh, photograph, hybrid conceptual photographic sculptural pieces from analog, uh, which I sp just spoke about, and you see I am here after all, and I'm showing you a detail of this now, which was commissioned by the Deer Foundation in New York and presented at Deer Beacon in 2008. This work uh, comprises some 4,000 postcard images of divergent views of the, of the famous tourist and honeymoon destination, Niagara Falls. Uh, it, presented across, it was first presented across a width of some 40 meters. I'm actually showing you um, uh, the installation of the work uh, in Zoe's retrospective exhibition at the Whitney in 2018. It is an accumulated landscape that posits, through the medium of photography, nature as cultural phenomenon that is both constructed and contingent. A committed activist since the 1980s uh, and through the early 90s, and I would say through to the present day, uh, but particularly in the 80s and in the early 90s, this was an era marked by heightened political awareness of the excuse me, of the overwhelming losses to the AIDS pandemic, which led Leonard to write the manifesto, I want a president, in 1992. Um, the manifesto was written in support of poet Eileen Miles' presidential bid as an independent candidate alongside George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton and Ross Perot. The, fee, the piece, you may be able to read some of it there, the piece famously begins with the words, I want a dyke for a president, I want a person with AIDS for president, and I want a fag for vice president, and I want someone with no health insurance, and it goes on. Leonard revisited the text, which had, become, which had uh, come to circulate widely in the form of a postcard uh, on a monumental scale, for here you see this, uh, for the High Line in New York at the time of the 2016 presidential election. The work became a viral sensation on social media. Leonard returned to her words on the eve of the 2020 presidential election, an event that was marred by the COVID-19 crisis, economic disruption, and nationwide demonstrations in the US against institutional racism and police brutality. She stated at the time, I am interested in the space this text opens up for us to imagine and voice what we want in our leaders. And even beyond that, what we can envis envision for the future of our society. I still think that speaking up is itself a vital and powerful political act. Two decades apart, I want a president and El Rio to the river invite us to look closely and from myriad perspectives at the social and political landscape of our times so that we also might imagine an ethics of a shared world and of a common humanity. So to the conversation. I think we're all done. Oh, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> so just a slightly, a little bit more preamble here. Um, El Rio to the river. Thousands of shots taken around the work, around over 400 photographs here um, in, at the MCA, we're presenting around 300 uh, of those photographs uh, taken by you uh, along a 2,000 kilometer uh, section of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, that begins in the border towns of El Paso, Texas, and uh, Ciudad Juarez in Mexico, and runs through uh, flows through to the mouth of the river where it comes out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this, court, this flow of the river and this uh, length of the river has since the mid 19th century demarcated the border between the United States of Mexico and the United States of, the, of America. It is considered as a natural feature, a water resource, a political border and an inhabited region. Landscapes, desert and mountains, cities, villages, the, and the activities 
that happen in those places, agriculture, commerce, industry, policing, surveillance. We can see all of this as we too walk the course of El Rio. We see the materiality of the border through infrastructure, through the built environment, through dams, levees, roads, irrigation canals, bridges, pipelines, fences, checkpoints, and detention facilities. We also see the control, control of the flow of water, of the passage of goods, and the movement of peoples. Zoe, finally, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, the term the episodic journey has been used to talk about your work. El Rio must be the ultimate episodic, episodic journey within your oeuvre. Could you share with us or talk a little bit about how the work began intellectually and how it evolved as action? Hi, everyone. Um, before I answer that first um, question, I wanted to just thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. I had no idea that you were going to talk about my whole practice in that way, but that was Oops. just so beautiful and such an um, insightful summation. So thank you for that. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming here to be inside with us on like a gorgeous, sunny Saturday afternoon. Um, I want to echo... Uh, the acknowledgement that Megan made and also the thanks to Suzanne, to Megan and the entire MCA team who've just been really unbelievable. And the other people that Suzanne mentioned who uh, worked, who collaborated with me on the book and my studio manager, Jocelyn. And to add to that, I also wanted to thank um, Auntie Ding for her really beautiful welcome to country the other evening. Um, for me, it was, um, we do land, we've started to um, speak land acknowledgements in my country, but there's, um, I'm learning a lot about the conversation here, um, and it's really interesting how profound and how alive that conversation is here. Um, and I want to thank Auntie Ding for that beautiful welcome to country. She spoke with enormous wisdom, grace, humor, rigor, and I was just struck mostly by the generosity of that um, welcoming. She spoke really importantly about respect, respect for elders, for people, for country, and for language. Um, her words resonated so deeply, and, um, and I think they're gonna stay with me for a long time. Um, and it felt, um, well, I guess, Suzanne and I, when Suzanne first invited me to bring El Rio here and the museum um, to host it, uh, from the beginning, our conversation was always about how would this work? How would it sit in the context here? How could, will it, would it have meaning? Would it have resonance? How could we help to make that connective tissue to connect this work to conversations um, that are happening here on all these different levels. So it's been kind of a tremendous honor and really, really interesting. I've been here almost a month now to install and to prepare and now for things like today and just kind of learning about the parallels and divergences between the, the certain issues in my country and, and issues here in this, in this country. Um, so, what was that question again, Suzanne? <laughs> no, it was about how, how it began. It begin? Yeah, how did it begin? Um, I mean, I guess for, uh, I know there's some artists in the audience and a couple of you guys that I've met, not Julie and Dee, it's so nice to see you. Um, you know, any new work starts from a myriad of places. You know, you have ideas that you, wanted to use and you didn't use and they're buried and then they come back to you. So tracing the beginning point of any work is always kind of complex. But I'd say there were a couple of things that were very active for me. I think um, I've been spending time out in West Texas and Northern Mexico for close to 20 years. Um, 
like a few months a year um, through the Chinati Foundation, which is located in Marfa. I began to get to know that landscape and spent a lot of time hiking and walking along the Rio Grande, frequently crossing over into northern Mexico. Um, but interestingly, all of those years, I never took a picture. I mean, I would take snapshots with my phone, but every potential photograph I would see, I was like, oh no. Like, oh, this mountain, oh, a sunset, oh, this lonely road with the electric poles, oh, this horse. All of it just seemed so um, tainted with a certain kind of mythology, a certain kind of way that that part of the world has been photographed and mythologized since the 19th century. And I just steered clear of it. But I did make that camera obscura, which was a way of allowing for um, a kind of depiction that was um, in tune with uh, real time. I did it very simply by sort of um, cleaning and kind of um, just cleaning this building, painting it, um, painting the floor, um, sort of preparing it that way, blocking out the windows and inserting a lens in one of the windows. It was a huge building. So like 120 feet long, so like 30 something meters, 40 meters, um, and about um, 12 meters deep. So it's a really big old industrial building parallel to a train track. And this was my first photographic engagement with that landscape, um, more than a decade after I'd begun spending time there, thinking about um, it's opposite a freight train track parallel to it. And I was thinking about um, the late 1800s and the development of the railroad and the camera sort of coming into being at the same time. And the manifest destiny, um, westward expansion, the genocide of um, many of the native peoples of uh, our continent. Um, and all of the kind of the, the, the really uh, beginning of this rapacious um, extractive economy in, in North America. So putting the, this camera parallel to the train allowed me to kind of think about all of those things. And the view was of like the kind of working end of town. It, it didn't have like the town hall and the like, beautiful water tower, like the signature places where people go to Instagram when they're like, I'm in Marfa. Um, it was like the working end. It was like um, these sort of very modest industrial buildings, oil tanks where the freight trains come in. Um, so that was when I started to think about ways that I could engage with the landscape photographically that broke free of some of the tropes and myths that had been constructed in previous photographic histories. The other thing about that is there's no image actually captured. It's happening in real time. Y if you go on a different day than me, you see something completely different. So the image doesn't belong any more to me than to you. It's this constantly, constantly changing image, a cloudy day, a rainy day, at night, during sunrise, sunset. Um, and when the, when the show was over, I took the lens out of the window, put it in a box like this big, and it was done. There was nothing to sell. There was nothing to take home. You couldn't possess it in any way. So that was another really important move to me, both in my trajectory as a photographer <clears throat> and a conceptual artist, and specifically in relation to that landscape. Um, I think the Niagara Falls postcard piece also, um, that's our Canadian border, thinking again about the mythologizing of certain landscapes and how photography has been taken up to establish territory, um, to uh, establish a kind of ownership in the minds of people, to establish this perspective and point of view, um, and so I think I've been playing with all those ideas for a long time. Then in 2016, uh, the, our presidential election in my country went very differently than any of us anticipated. 
I don't think any of us really thought Trump could win, and then he did. We thought we were going to have our first woman president, flawed though she may be, a you know, far better choice in my opinion, in my, in my humble opinion. Um, so in the right after the election, I had planned to go spend the winter out in Marfa and um, to go for a period of months, the longest I'd ever gone for. And um, uh, I was kind of like, after the results, I was like, I don't really want to go to Texas right now. Um, I'd rather stay in New York. A lot of my friends are protesting uh, in the streets. And I kind of slept on it, and I thought, you know, maybe that's actually the best place for me to go. I'm just going to do what I planned, and we'll see, and I can always come home. Um, so while in Texas, I had a little bit of, um, I don't know, I was thinking about how I wanted to be in this time. Um, I wanted to, I have done activism. I haven't done direct action in a long time, but I did a lot of direct action a number of years ago. And I thought, well, I don't, I actually don't really want to be in the street. I went to a couple of protests, but I was like, I don't, don't really want to get arrested and do all that. I want to dig into my practice. Um, I'm a mid-career artist. I've been doing it a long time. I wanted to, um, figure out how to be true to my own voice and kind of dig into my practice and do what I love doing, which is taking pictures and observing places. Um, and there was, and to do that without turning my back on the turmoil in my country. So I was trying to think about how to do that. And I, I took a long walk with a friend one evening and I kind of came, I just was like talking and talking and she was like asking me about trying to sort of egg it out of me. And I was like, well, I think it's the river. It's the river really makes its way through um, this landscape over 2000, 2000 miles. Um, and it's not only a physical landscape of land and water, it's a social and political landscape. Um, and by following this river, it would take me through cities, towns, villages, detention centers, dams, um, fences, policing activity, that sort of all of the burning um, questions of our time were in some way actually um, uh, cut through you know, that the, that the river would cut this path through all of those things. And that if I were to follow the river and observe the river with an open mind and a camera, I could perhaps try to better understand how we'd gotten here and what might be other ways of thinking about the situation. So it's a long answer, but, yeah, but the right. artists in the audience understand, right? Yeah. So, yeah. It's never from one thing, it's, right? It's a great. Uh, no, that's what you're here for. We want those long answers. Um, well, just to sort of perhaps a continuation of that, um, I thought it could be interesting to talk just a little bit about time in the work. There's the time of taking the photographs over five years. Um, there was the time of the production, but there's also the time of the photo of the that is captured in the image in itself and in the photographic process. Um, and you ha yourself have talked about um, the, the composition of this exhibition is speaking to many things, photography, and the, its history, um, as we know, and we'll come back to that a little bit later on, um, but also uh, the types of photographs that you take in a time of news feeds and viral social media posts. So I just wondered if you might speak a little bit um, to that idea of time. I know it's a very big subject, but maybe some of the things you might want to um, mention. Yeah, time. That's a big one. Let's lock the doors. We're going to be here all day. Um, time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think there are, as you say, you sort of um, laid out some of it for me. There are a number of different kinds of time happening. Um, the work is composed in passages. 
there are single images. Some passages are just a single image, but many of the passages are four photographs or seven photographs or 12 photographs or six photographs. Um, and they are not exactly repetition, but there's a kind of a seriality where either an action is unfolding in the frame, you're watching something happen, um, a cowboy bringing a young calf back across the river, um, uh, cars waiting to go through a checkpoint on a bridge. Um, so there's either an action unfolding or the camera's moving. I'm moving through the landscape, kind of looking at different parts of it. So you're sort of following my sequential uh, uh, observing of a place. Um, so that was a way of thinking about, um, uh, I mean, at one time I had thought about making a video. I've never made, well, I've made a couple of short films, but um, but I decided to stick with photography, but I wanted to play with this sort of in-between space that um, nodded to cinema in a certain way and thought about movement and change to allow for... Um, the idea of like multiplicity of viewpoint and sort of like as the frame moves around, what's in and out of the frame. Um, I, wanting to get away from the kind of singularity of a monolithic, this is the perfect moment, this is exactly what happened, this is truth. But to kind of get into this idea of complexity that um, not only is the world changing in front of our eyes, our presence and our perspective are changing as we move through it. It's a dynamic situation. It's not a still situation. So I'm a big believer in kind of contingency, tangent, um, like shifting. So the composition here in uh, at the MCA, um, which we worked out over several months working closely with Marcos Corrales, who is the exhibition designer, is a dear friend and an absolutely brilliant um, architect and designer, but then also on site here for almost three weeks. Every day in the gallery, moving things around, trying things out. And that kind of time, I think, um, not to get too abstract here, but spatial time. Um, I think uh, certain scales or, of images or certain um, kinds of installations encourage you to move quickly and others encourage you to slow down. Everyone's going to do what they're going to do. Maybe you're on your phone the whole time. Maybe you're going to sit on a bench and start emailing people or Instagramming. That's all fine. But I think the way that you, I mean, I'm not against any of that. I do it myself. Um, but I think an installation, you, I'm thinking about crafting and, and sort of tailoring the work into the space in a way to encourage you to spend more time, to look more closely, to slow down. Um, and so there's a lot of negative space. Like there's not, it's, it's a big show and there are several hundred photographs, as Suzanne said, but there's also a lot of negative space. And that's there for you. Like that's there for you to be able to have the room to move around, the room to have your own thoughts, the room to kind of move through the space. And so I think these two things as they are in our lives, time and space are in like a constant, um, also dynamic um, interplay. That's how we experience life. So um, in one conversation, Suzanne was asking me about this and I said, well, I think, you know, the, the work in a way is a score and then the installation becomes this kind of performance. It's live at each place. It's tailored to the spaces and to the context. And certain things became more important to me as I thought about the Australian landscape and the Australian history and certain images took on deeper significance as I had more conversations here, it was like, oh no, we have to include that one for this or that reason. Um, well, actually sort of jumps to another question, but I'd just stay on that for a moment. 
Uh, this is the third iteration, third presentation of the work. As Megan mentioned earlier, it began in Luxembourg at the Museum of Contemporary Art. It was then presented in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. Now it's being presented here. In each time, I mean, it is the same work, but each time is a, a different iteration. It has some different um, rhythms, I think, and pulses. And of course, something you really uh, were very excited about, and I think you've um, conceived of so beautifully in dialogue with Marcos and also with the team here is the way it's situated not only in the galleries but how the galleries are situated here on Talawalada and looking out onto the water, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the rooms we're the most excited about from the beginning um, were the the side of the galleries that have the windows opening out onto the harbor. And so in all of this life, you know, it's a working harbor. People are commuting and coming and going, and there's boats of all, from those giant, um, like, uh, cruise ship, like crazy cruise ships that come in and, like, block the view to the opera house. But then ferries coming and going, it's an active place, and, um, and, it's, a, and it's a place, it's a that is country, that has a deep, deep history. So having that connection to the outside world, to people moving um, and to the views onto the water um, felt really um, uh, very significant. And when we did what Suzanne refers to as the kind of dramaturgy, the arc of the work, the flow that we worked out, um, the circulation, those rooms come towards the end, about three quarters in. So you sort of move into a certain world. There are bigger galleries and smaller galleries, and then you come out into maybe the seventh or eighth gallery, and that's where you get the view onto the water. And we put in there um, these images of um, border policing, like a sort of very intense kind of operational room of helicopters and border patrol vehicles dragging and do undergoing an arrest and so there's a lot of activity in that room and we put a bench there so we were always thinking about not just which photographs but where and how um, to um, to create a certain arc for the viewer um I've got way too many questions, but you've been answering a lot of them anyway. <laughs> I'm going to group a couple. Just If we can just stay a little bit longer on this idea of the narrative, um, or, or of narrative in general. I mean, you've talked about cinema. I mean, we're talking about photography. We've talked about cinema. You've talked about the score, so the idea of music or a composition. Um, and you've also talked about our Rio as an epic. So we're thinking of the literary narrative. And as we know, if we think of sort of the epic epics of... Ulysses or of Moby Dick, they're all about journeys, actually, and often they're about journeys taken and ultimately for people to find only to be looking to find themselves back at home. And in a way, the way you were describing your the impulse to make or among the impulses to make our Rio is also about trying to understand what where your place is. Um, and so we see that, and you mentioned the dramaturgy, but there's a the um within this pacing and the thinking about the particular spaces in which you see and passages, um, individual works, uh, passages of images, different temporalities that are going on, um, it's all very uh, carefully thought out. And indeed, in the very beginning, I think the first room that you enter into um, when you enter the exhibition after this sort of introduction and you go left, um, it's you've did you did this in Luxembourg and I think in Paris. Mm -hmm. it was, I remember it very clearly because we installed the work together in Luxembourg, but here, but this idea of a, a kind of exposition of the a, a presentation or an introduction to the cast of characters. So you have the river itself, but you have the border crossings, you have markers of colonial history, you have the wall, and you have the border patrol. So there is um, just these things, I think, that make up, in my mind, that sort of contribute to this dramaturgy. But you also talk about El Rio being a text. Um, and we mentioned um, the publication uh, earlier, and Tim Johnson, the, um, who's the editor with Zoe of the publication, I have my hand on it here. Um, it's a two-volume publication. 
Um, and Zoe has described its languages as being English, uh, English, Spanish, French, and photography, <laughs> which is very appropriate. So um, I just, uh, and equally, and here this is maybe leading to the question, within the exhibition itself, for those of you who have seen it, it begins, it was very important, there's not very much text, there's the introductory panels, but thereby it's in English and Spanish. And then otherwise, there isn't really, there are no labels, wall labels. There's a description of the work as a whole, but that's it. So I it would just be, I think it would be great for people to hear you to speak a little bit about those that decision or the decisions involved in that. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean that was kind of um, you know we we uh, the book um, was published in order to come out in time for the first um, exhibition of the work at Mudam Luxembourg, as Suzanne mentioned. So the book act actually had to be completely finished before it ever installed the whole piece. So I was still printing and kind of um, getting ready for the, the first exhibition while we were finishing the design of the book because it had to go and be printed and then shipped and all of that. So some of the questions about how the work would be presented, what it's, um, uh, how it would, yeah, the frame in which it would be presented to the public, many of that was actually worked out during the book. Um, the and, and helped me find certain structures and arrive at certain principles that had to do not with the work itself, but with how it would sit in the public. Um, and that's always a big transition from like the studio into the world. Um, so, um, Joseph Logan, dear friend, is brilliant book designer. Um, we were working on the um, layout of the photographs together, and Tim Johnson, also dear friend, and absolutely just um, a wonderful poet and thinker, collaborator, um, and friend. Um, he was really focusing on the text volume while Joseph and I were doing the layout of the image volume. And we kept saying, oh yeah, no, I was like, no, I want to have some kind of like caption that says where we are, but I can't figure out what that is yet. Let's just lay out the photographs and we'll figure that part out later. And so it took us a few months to get the sequencing right for the book. And then we're like, oh God, it has to go to the printer. What about the captions? What about the caption? What about the captions? And along this, like, I'm like, um, um, well, I'm, I'm a nerd. Like I'm a, I'm like to read the thesaurus. I like like to read the dictionary. Like I'm, and you know I'm like one of those people. And I'd been thinking about oh like how do I say it? I was like oh from from the you know from El Paso looking towards Juarez, from Juarez looking to from the to the and I like you know I mean the notebooks full of like, and then I was like well how am I gonna give a name to any of these places? Am I gonna give the Spanish name? Am I gonna give the English name? Am I gonna try to find out what a, one of the many possible indigenous names was for this place? Do I name it, I'm often in a rural area, do I say near Brownsville, near Reynosa, upstream of, downstream of? Do I do latitude and longitude? Then we're talking about science and navigation, and that has a whole that's a whole other system of knowledge that also is about power and control and uh, a kind of you know Linnaean marking of um, place. Um, and then one day I was just like, you know what? We're in a system already. It's photography. No, we don't need any of that. And how helpful would it actually be to a reader or a viewer of the book or the exhibition to see a little caption that's like, near Brownsville? <laughs> like, what would that mean to you? Would that help you understand where you were? Would that locate you? Would that add meaning? I also realized that as we had done the layout in the book, that there's language inside the photographs. There's the language of photography, the framing, the tone, the grain, the light, the 
the black frame, but there's also the lang language in some of the subjects. There are um, boundary markers, there are bridges, there are signs, there are, there's body language uh, among people. There's the signs and signifiers, flags, gates, fences. So there's the, the photographs can be read. And what seemed more important to me than identifying a certain location on a map would be to make the photographs to allow the photographs to offer the kind of um, diet, they, they do a kind of diagrammatic function where you can read, if not a precise location, a situation. This is a rural situation where there's grazing or ranching. This is an urban situation where there's a lot of movement. This is a situation where people are commuting. This is a situation where Clearly, there's like border patrol and customs activity. This is a policing situation. This is an operation. So I think those things are visible in the photographs and that it felt more powerful to me rather than making it feel like homework where you're like, oh God, where am I? And oh my God, and what's the thing? And what's the name? And where are we? To allow people the space to recognize what might be happening and uh, associate it with the... Uh, things in their own lives, things you've observed in your own life, things that are happening in your country. I think most of the questions, the issues that are live and urgent along the, uh, along the uh, course of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, and along the US-Mexico border, those questions and issues, I think, have parallels here in Australia, but also everywhere in the world. Questions about water and drought, about climate crisis, about heritage, homeland, um, questions of belonging and history, questions of like the post-colonial reckoning that we're in the midst of questions of politics, questions of economy, questions of, you know, extractive violence. Um, all of these are things that we're all facing. And so I think it's, for me, it's a work that's very respectful of and deeply embedded in a specific place or set of places where I spent time and observed. But as an artwork, I hope that it can be part of conversations in multiple places and that it can actually open up new axes of conversation um, f for me, for all of you, for that's what I hope and I feel at its best that's what art does, right? It becomes this kind of portal between our given ideas and the potential for new conversation, right? So that's what I'm really excited about. So that's also another really long answer for a very simple thing of like, why there's no captions anywhere. <laughs> and there you have it. That's my 45 minute exposition on why there's no captions. But it's just, to, just, just in my defense, every time you make a book, like a catalog, there's usually this pressure. Thank God for Suzanne Cotter. Thank God for Nicola Van Velsen at Haji Kantz. Thank God for Tim Johnson, because, or goddess, excuse me, rather thank the goddess. But because often there's this pressure, like, no, 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 there has to be a caption, there has to be a thing. And so many museums in give me the hardest time about not wanting wall labels. I mean, this is like, all right, you're gonna have to sit down with the entire team so that there isn't like a label like this that explains the work, the meaning of the work, what you should think about the work, and this sort of like, that interprets the work for the viewer. So to actually have 15,000 square feet, like to have all of these galleries with just a couple of little wall labels that are this big that say, and that one text at the beginning, that kind of space isn't always given over to an artist. Museums have protocols and, you know, when a viewer comes in, a lay viewer who hasn't worked on the dark side of the museum, 
in the back of house, right? You don't know about those protocols. But as an artist entering in, it's not just like, oh, we come in and like we get whatever we want and it's so glamorous. <laughs> it's actually, I mean, it is, but no. Um, I mean, it's really, really hard work and there are, there you you're collaborating with an institution that has its own rules. And so actually convincing an institution or working with someone brilliant and fearless like Suzanne and Megan, at, that where you're actually encouraged to place the work the way you want to and the way you think it's most powerful and uh, letting go of certain institutional protocols, the, it's something you I'm often asked to defend. So it doesn't actually come easy. And I have to really think it through like, is this, I'm gonna pick my battles is this one worth fighting? And in the end, we reached no, we had no resistance at all. And like, we were all just like, oh my God, they agreed to no captions. Yeah. Like, we sent Suzanne the PDF and we're like, should we mention the no captions? And Joseph and I were like, let's not mention it. Maybe she won't notice me. Yeah, yeah. You know, of course like, I noticed. You know, and then she sent it back and she was like, and then I wrote her and she was like, oh, it's beautiful. Da, da, da. And then I was like, do you mind that doesn't come? She's like, oh, it doesn't need it. The book just explains itself. She said, the images do all the work, it's beautiful. But that's rare, I'm just gonna say. So, hence my long essay on captions. Thank you, sorry. Well, you make it so easy for me. I mean, you're sort of, you're doing all the work, but you know, so generous in your answers. But I, I just like to respond to that, what you were saying about the museum. I guess our privilege working in a, mu in a museum of contemporary art is that we can be, and we must be, um, guided by the artist because this is the history of, uh, from a museum point of view, it's the history of great museums where they've been able to respond to what the artist is trying to achieve and it's the artist who's really leading us. Um, so it's an enormous privilege for us. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that plug, that's amazing. Um, uh, uh, now, okay. We've got, there's so many questions, a couple more maybe, because then perhaps we can allow a little bit of time for some uh, possible qu potential questions from our wonderful audience. Um, but, you know, you talked really eloquently just now about what um, choices you are making or the way you've, the images, you want them to function. And you've also been very clear that it's not a work of photojournalism. It's a work of art. You are an artist, you're not a photojournalist and El Rio is a work of art. But it does document and it depicts. And at times um, it's pictorial, I would suggest. I mean, I see a strong, in your eyes, I see a strong visual memory of a history of painting as well as a history of photography. Um, it's Sometimes it's forensic, I would suggest, uh, and other times abstract. So I wonder if you just might say a few things about those different um, formal dimensions that are present in the in El Rio. Wow, that's such a great question. It's thank you. I mean, you sort of also laid out what some of those different um, different formal approaches are. Um, yeah, I mean, I I look at a lot of art, a lot of painting, dance. Um, uh, listen to music, and I look very broadly at photography, f you know, um, from 19th century to contemporary. Um, and I think, I mean, as analog was, uh, the the work that you showed earlier, that Suzanne showed us earlier, that, that work analog, it, it had a set of subjects and ideas and concerns, but it was also kind of a love song to photography and um, the history of photography and at J and, you know, square format and, you know, um, all that, uh, all that good stuff. Um, and the title itself. Um, uh, you know, photography, I would sort of suggest, is not only um, a recorder of current events, but also a tool that's used to construct history. Um, how something is photographed and presented, um, how images 
um, move through the world to you know mass media distribution or in museums and galleries in magazines um, a worldview is constructed through that um, in our newspapers and journals and online in in various like social media feeds we see political candidates being constructed. We see certain arguments being constructed through the use of a photograph, how something is depicted. So I think from the very beginning of fixing the image, um, so we're talking, you know, 19th century, uh, you know, the, the camera has kind of, yeah, it's had this role. Um, and I think this work for me was very much um, simultaneously uh, my, uh, an expression of my deep love and appreciation of, the, of photo history, all different kinds. You know, I was thinking about the Provoke era and like Japanese post-war photography. I was thinking about Italian neorealists and like French um, post-war cinema. And I was thinking about 19th century, you know, Carlton Watkins and Moybridge for all of the problematics of those practitioners, um, the, the sheer beauty of their work. I was thinking about how meaning gets constructed through photography. So it was this kind of both, um, as in much of my work where there's something, I have something critical to say um, about wanting to undo or unbuild a certain kind of history, like unpack it, but also like I love it, you know, and I and I look a lot and there are, there are times where I'm like, oh yeah, this is kind of like, you know, a Rossellini film right here with this ferryman digging out the bank. Or, um, or like those dogs on the bank in Laredo, um, you know, I'm thinking Provoke era Japanese, sort of like the incredible post-war Japanese photography that was really about finding a new photographic language to express the devastation of the post-war and the occupation of Japan. And some of the most um, eloquent and jarring and kind of um, uh, potent photography of our time came out of Japan in that post-war period. I mean, it's just really astonishing if you don't know it. Um, you know, so anyway, so I was kind of thinking about all those histories and then thinking about something I referred to before, the ways in which photographs have been used to construct and, and create certain mythologies about the quote unquote American West and about Mexico. And this construction of the American West when like, quite frankly, it really had been Mexico until quite recently. And that in many viewpoints, you know, the Mexico is right there, it's like 10 feet away. So um, the kind of idea of territory that comes along with this idea of the great American West. Um, so this work, I, I mean, I said this the other day, and I, you know, Audre Lorde says you can't use his master's tools to um, take apart the master's house. Um, and I love Audre Lorde. She's a, a North Star, I think, for many people. Um, and I think that's a profoundly important point. And yet I'm a photographer, so I'm like, well, can I? Can I take up the camera? to undo all that the camera has done. Uh, to be totally honest, there were many moments during the six years where I was like, wow, this was the stupidest idea I've ever had. <laughs> this was really, really dumb. Like, no, it won't work. What am I doing here with a camera? Nothing good has ever come of like a white person standing there with a camera. It's just not a good idea. Um, but other times I had faith in myself and my stance and that maybe my camera could take some pictures in between the other pictures that have already been taken. That maybe my viewpoint could somehow intercede in the current, the constant stream of images that we receive around the world from, of this region 
at, that keeps showing the borderlands in the same kind of um, a series of, uh, what do you call it, like um, tropes and cliches over and over and over again. And by the um, way, interestingly, cliche is the French for snapshot. Ah, how great. So, wow, I didn't know sorry. that. Sorry. No, no, that's fantastic. Just saying. Yeah, no apologies <laughs> there. So yeah, all these cliches that you see over and over and over again, and these really violent images um, that are taken to, that criminalize through the way the image is constructed, that, Im that criminalize people who are living their lives, crossing the border, and, and, and sort of put this whole weight of, uh, uh, create a perception of people that isn't, um, that is uh, short-sighted and um, subjective to say the least. So in a way, I'm thinking, okay, we all have cameras, We most of us, many of us have like a camera in our phone. We live in a kind of constant stream of images and so it's here, it's not going away. And so my, you know, again, perhaps not a good idea, but my idea is like, well, get in that stream and see if there's a way to add to it or shift it and show that there, it is possible to present a different point of view than the one that is um, constantly available to us in kind of mass media representation. So while there is upstairs, you will see certain situations that are depicted in the news. There are operations of Border Patrol. There is a kind of extended arrest sequence, um, but it's photographed in a very different way than it. those things are normally photographed. I'm photographing it in a way that is diagrammatic and that calls attention to the operation and the powers in the frame rather than criminalizing a specific person or revealing their face or trying to humiliate them in any way. And that goes for Border Patrol agents as well as for people that may be being arrested or people that might be doing any kinds of other activity along the river. I made a decision that I, I just didn't want to hold any individual I didn't want to make anyone's individual face carry the weight of an enormous situation that's largely outside of their control. So you see figures and body language, but there's a lot of focus on infrastructure. And so the implication is to larger structures, power structures, sometimes that are outside the frame, but you see the results in the frame. So. God, another long answer, but there you go. Oh, it's so brilliant. Well, I have one last question for you then, because you're talking about, actually, um, you helped me um, begin that question. <laughs> Is everyone okay for one more question? <laughs> um, yes, we got a big vociferous yes there, um, which was just more about the process of photographing. You've just alluded to it but you, um, in, in many of your answers. I mean, you were moving across the river all the way along and we were at different times as we follow the work we're actually looking we're looking um, from the Mexican side or from the US side some of those crossings were a bit slightly there was activity or perilous um, there was a lot going on um, and you also you worked with a lot of people you've talked about Tim Johnson Tim Johnson was not only who is a poet is not only the editor of the book with Zoe Val Rio was a, he was a he was a partner and he accompanied you on many on much of this journey. Um, so the artist and the poet, as you describe it, um, and not the not the photojournalist and the reporter. Um, you had Deirdre. There was like the park ranger. You know, <laughs> there were there's there's a cast of people who are involved in this collaboration. Is also, I guess. Uh, uh, a feature of the way you work. You've talked a lot about that. But I think it would be very interesting for our audience to hear just maybe a, a little bit more about the physical, as some of the the physical things that you had to do to actually make the work, you know, apart from obviously walking and getting in your car. But it was a very physical and it was a performative process, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, Tim, I mean, Tim Johnson, he's a, 
just incredible um, person and incredibly brilliant and gifted. We were good friends before this, and he and his wife, Caitlin, are both good friends, and I'd been in conversation with them from the very beginning and had invited him to come along with me, um, thinking that eventually there might be a show and eventually there might be a book, and if that were to happen, would he want to write a piece? And then, so I think I was about two years in when he came out for the first time with me, and we had uh, Tim, he's going to come visit, actually. He's going to do some programming here at the MCA in, in October, October, so he can tell you a lot more then if, if you come back. Um, but he had lived in, in Juarez, and he, um, Tim, lifelong Texan, um, just, he, he knew a lot, so he had information to share, but more than that, he, our conversations were about information and history, but they were also a lot about form and concept, about how to um, compose uh, a work of art that um, does skim very close to current events and the news and what it means to, to, um, to cross over into that, the, the, the kind of realm of the document or, or photojournalism, but also to understand the limitations of my own knowledge um, and or what I, what I wanted to put forth, like what my charge was, what our charge was. So Tim was an important uh, collaborator. As to the kind of physical process of photographing, in the making of the work, there's, there was the idea that came to me pretty wholesale um, in one thought. Um, uh, there was the photography, there was the editing, um, the printing, and then, you know, the installation at the different venues. Um, so there's making an art, this artwork took, you know, s six years, um, and it's still changing at each venue. Um, in terms of the photography piece of it, um, I knew it would be, like when I had the idea, I was really excited, and at the same time was like, oh no, this is gonna be so hard. It's like, okay, 1,200 miles of river, you know, that's 2,000 kilometers, that's a lot of land. I knew some small parts of it, I had spent time in some small parts of it, but I didn't, um, I, I realized it was going to be just physically very demanding to cover that much terrain. Um, it's very hot during certain times of year. There are um, parts that are very remote where you're, you know, um, really far from um, any kind of, uh, you know, town or village, often on, you know, dirt roads um, or, you know, or out on a boat, um, uh, you know, camping or... Um, so sometimes the conditions were just hard. Um, you know, I, I also like hate for this to be a cliche, but like, you, you like rattlesnakes, you know, at dawn and, and dusk for sure, sometimes in the middle of the day too, but definitely, um, you know, you really got to mind your watch where you step when it's like in the semi-dark, you know, spiders. So there's all that and there's heat. So dehydration, like, you know, if you're out shooting for six hours, taking pictures, um, you know, sometimes it was 104 degrees, 106 degrees. It was, so it was physically demanding in that way. Um, uh, the learning was a lot. Um, uh, the trying to understand what was happening and um, make sense of what I was seeing. Um, and then there was something that was really new for me, which was really working um, inside a, a zone that um, was becoming more and more militarized by the minute. Um, when I started in 2016, um, there was already, you know, there were, walls have been being built since um, 1848. It's not new to have a fence or a wall, um, but there had been a lot of rhetoric, and now there was a lot of funding, and pieces of wall were going up. Um, the United States was sort of in this very divisive period of time where um, it didn't always feel safe, 
to walk around in an area where your point of view politically was different than the point of view of the people that lived there. Um, we were often working, I always wanted to get as close to the river as possible. That was my, I mean, I could like, there were so many things I wanted to photograph and check out, but I was like, no, 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 back to the river, back to the river. And so often to get to the bank of the river, um, I've never got special permission or dispensation from anyone. I never asked for it. Um, I didn't want that. I didn't want to be embedded. I didn't want permission. I didn't want any of that. Um, so I mostly photographed from public viewpoints um, or areas that were where it was like a gray question. I never trespassed. If there was a sign that was like, do not trespass, you can't mess with that in Texas. You'll get shot. Like, you just can't do it. Um, and I also really didn't want to get arrested. I wanted to make my art. And I was like, I don't want to get arrested. So I did that. But sometimes it might not be posted, but there could be activity going on that no, and no one wants you there. No one wants you there, and certainly no one wants you there with a camera. So along the embankments, along the levees, um, often there would be sort of, um, you know, a, a lot, a, like a, quite a lot of policing activity. And um, I, you know, was at it a couple of years before Tim uh, joined me. And I have to say, Tim and I found some really good ways to figure it out together. Um, but, you know, we'd sort of be like, yeah, we're the only people here that aren't armed. And it was scary. Like it was, I, you know, I'm like a conceptual artist from New York, you know? Like I'm not a photojournalist, I'm not a war reporter. I mean, I'd done some activism, but I was just like, oh, this is a whole other level. And over the course of the five years of photographing, um, it was just intense to see the amount of resources that were being deployed, deployed, and I mean the word deployed. Um, the and so the increasing kind of um, very concrete expressions of this, uh, you know, uh, United States uh, immigration policy, border policy. Um, so the amount of policing, um, the amount of tension. Um, uh, you know, and in certain areas, um, there's, you know, also a lot of um, policing activity on the Mexican side as well, and um, and in some areas, like, considerable narco activity that was visible, and, and you have to be pretty careful with a camera um, in those situations, because it's, um, it, that's, you know, Mexico is, uh, like, the Human Rights Watch has really identified it as the most dangerous place, most dangerous country in the world for journalists, which is kind of shocking when you think about all the places where it's really dangerous to be a photojournal, a journalist. Um, and so, although we were a poet and an artist, it's like, you know, we're both wearing like gray and green, like really boring, like, you know, boring clothes um, with our hats and like me with my camera and Tim with his notebook. So we kind of looked like journalists. No one's going to ask for a press pass before, you know, something bad happens. So there were just areas where we knew, um, I mean, we had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of encounters with, um, with various forms of, um, law enforcement and, um, and other, other situations that really didn't, didn't necessarily want us to be there. So we had to learn how to move, how to do what, keep our mind on what we were doing, figure out if we were okay in a certain place without permission, but just doing what we're doing, and how to, how to move through that landscape um, in a way to kind of keep us as safe as possible and not make, not spark a potentially difficult situation. Thank you. The question is almost a double barrel question. Do you see yourself as an activist artist? And if so, understanding how more and more art and galleries have become inaccessible, intellectually inaccessible, it becomes more esoteric, it becomes more focused on um, tools and um, trade, and um, 
elitism, I would like to ask you is, it's an important political um, narrative that you are playing out in your art. How, how would you make it more accessible to the layperson since it is a political message or narrative that needs to be shared? It may be like related questions, yeah. it seems. I think, I think they are. I mean, I don't consider myself an activist. I did activism a number of years ago, and I absolutely own all of that, and I was very much an activist. Yeah, so I don't, I don't see myself as an activist. I did, you know, I did direct action, I was arrested. I mean, I, I was like a very, very serious activist for a number of years. Um, and I don't do direct action anymore. That's not what I do. Um, I don't see myself as a political artist either. I know that that's a term. Um, I think all art has a politics to it. I think everything, any, every single thing any of us does at any point in every day of our lives has a politics to it. Where your muffin comes from, where your coffee was ground, it's all, it all has a politics to it. Everything you're wearing, everything you eat, everywhere you go, it all has a politics to it. Aesthetics is political, right? Beauty, concepts of beauty have a political resonance to them. You know, they're these are constructions that we make together and that we agree upon. So, I mean, I think this work engages with a number of different um, landscapes, if you will. I think there are questions about the planet and human civilization, how we have chosen to live with or um, wipe out other species or other groups of people, how we consider um, bodies of water or, uh, uh, or uh, how, how, how often human beings have kind of looked at the world around them as like a resource to be used um, through extraction. Um, human beings, I mean, obviously also like have done many beautiful things and wonderful things, but I think this piece is looking at a number of different kinds of tendencies um, uh, in how human civilization has constructed itself in relation to the world around it. And that mean it includes um, the land, the people, the other animals. Um, and uh, so I think um, there is a political read to the work. Um, and I also think there are all kinds of other reads to it. And I don't think that they're separate. There are parts here where, you know, I'm clearly just freaking out on how beautiful these pink flowers are. Like, that's what that moment is. I'm just, like, freaking out on how beautiful the pink flowers are and hoping you will, too. Um, there, are, there are moments of quiet. There are moments of tension. Um, I, don't see my, I don't see this work as having, like, a political message that I'm trying to get across. I'm not using my work in that way. And I can't speak to any other artist other than myself in terms of the thing about white cubes and galleries. Um, you know, ugh, everything has, a, everything's a problem, right? I mean, everything's a problem. Everything, like everything is a problem. That's just true. And I could just be like, it's all so dirty, I'm not doing any of it. Fuck it. I'm going to what? Live where? Eat what? Make what? Where's, where's the clean way to do it? I don't know. I choose to see, I was as a kid, you know, nerd as I am now, loved museums, loved looking at art, loved reading books. That was how I found who I was. That was where I felt good and okay and normal. I was like, oh, there's a place for me here. This is where I belong. It's from when I was a little kid. And so I'm like, for all the problems around, you know, 
all the problems. You know what they are. I don't have to list them for you. Um, these are platforms. So you can get stuck at like, this wall represents Yes, it does. Absolutely. All of that. But it's also a way through. It's a portal. Um, and one hopes that, you know, you may be able to have conversation and engagement with people through those portals. They're all, they all have some degree of compromise, but I, I choose to carry on. Like, I, that's what I'm choosing. I mean, the world is a shit show right now. And I hope we can, like, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, let's try a little bit. Let's, let's like rejoice together. Let's converse. Let's, eat together, let's drink together, let's look at art, let's like try to like see if we can recover some of it and like make something, you know, let's like let's 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 have some hope, right? And I I find some of that when I look at art, regardless of where it's located. Well, spontaneous applause. I don't even have to close. But, I mean, you know, Zoe, thank you so much just for this afternoon and for your generosity and speaking with everyone. But thank you especially. Thank you for your work. Thank you for El Rio. But thank you for being an artist and the artist that you are. And we are so honoured to have you here. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.